I'm going to get pretty quickly into the session. As I said, today's actually about running a live session. It's not about um, us coming in to tell you about Ella. It's about coming and experiencing a member group. We do have members in the group. Unfortunately, we've got three members that can't make, make it today, which is a shame, but um, nonetheless, we run the group every month. So for you that, you that are guests, you'll get to experience how the group works, which is great. Uh, we have got a few commercial guests as well, Louise and Guy here from Ian Brown. Um, I think that's, that's healthy at this early stage in Birmingham because we get some different perspectives, but they are working in the third sector, so hopefully they'll have some good insights for you. Um, okay, I think we'll crack on, really. Derry, um, Derry is a strategy specialist, works predominantly in the commercial sector, as most of our speakers do. We'd like to try and give you a, a different angle from the third sector. Um, Derry is a trustee of Global Angels as well, so he, he is familiar with the third sector. Um, I think I'm going to say no more, I'm going to let you crack on and uh, make money for the strategy. Thank you, Derek, for coming in. Right. Actually, with a round room, there's great acoustics here today, so you should be able to hear me all fine in this environment. Um, so, yes, just so you're aware, I have got, I've had um, numerous positions on boards so as chairman of the Multiple Experiences Therapy Centres. Uh, I've been a trustee on several boards, so I'm quite aware of the charitable sector. And to, be, and to be very honest with you, I honour all of you because I find this to be my biggest challenge in my business. The business is easy for best chaps. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to be bringing my experiences to the table. It's more about bringing your experiences, okay? So for people who aren't used to this environment, this is interactive. This is not me sitting up here speaking to you for the next few hours. You're going to get involved and we're also, by the time you leave today, I'm going to do a thing called strategy on a page and you're going to start to be on the page. This is, you're going to have a real clear takeaway from today and we're going to get straight into it. Um, so, let's get this exciting, shall we? Strategy is not meant to be done. And fortunately, strategy has been done in the corporate world a lot. So a lot of people talk about strategy, and actually a lot of people are talking about strategy incorrectly. So today I'm going to dispel a lot of myths. I'm going to get strategy simple and executionable, and I'm going to explain how I've been on this journey. Now, for that is the Marathon de Sarve. In 2006, in April the 7th, I crossed the finishing line of the Marathon de Sarve which is six marathons back to back across the Sahara Desert. Now I don't tell you that to impress you. I tell you, I tell you that so you can see, the only reason I did that was because I had a strong strategy. Now strategy, when we're talking about strategy, it's usually in a business context. And I want to widen your mind right from the beginning today. Strategy is relevant across all areas of life, okay? This is an adventure. Setting up a charity and running a charity is an adventure. It depends on how you decide to choose to, to lead that adventure and the strategy elements of that. Okay. Now, um, also, I'm not here to teach you anything. You're all leaders in your own right. You're all running your own businesses in your own right. But what I'm going to do, this is a cracking quote. Have you heard of Buckminster Fuller? This is a quote that's been around about 100 years. Some things, I, I love ancient wisdom that doesn't change. And for him, if you want to teach people a new way of thinking, don't bother to try to teach them. Instead, give them the tool, the use of which will lead to new ways of thinking. And that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to give you a real practical tool so you can start to execute strategy properly. Now, it looks like this. Now, for some reason, I can't get PowerPoint to make this look sexy, so I'll give you a handout. Uh, you can pass that back. This is called strategy on a page. In my humble opinion, if you can't get your entire strategy on a page from your macro purpose, all the way down to what you're doing today, then I, I would suggest you're not executing it properly. Now I'm gonna put a caveat in here, and this is a caveat particularly for Wayne, a conversation I have back there, and anyone else who's got bigger organizations, um, is that you might have several pages, okay? So for instance, group companies I work with, I've got a, a large telecoms company I work with in London, they have four pages, they have a group page, and they have three divisional pages because they've got a telecoms arm, they have a call center arm, and they have a technology arm. So when your businesses are fundamentally different, you need different pages. And the little trick here, and I'm just going to guide you through the page in a minute, is this box here, which is defined market space. That is, that is a very small box with a very important message, which is what space do we operate in? Okay, and I'm, that is... We'll, we'll, we're going to touch on that a little bit later, but that defines how many pages you've got. So for them, the telecoms company operates in the telecom space. So think about that in the third sector of the charity space. If you are currently operating in a children's space, and suddenly then you want to penetrate adults, your strategy will be fundamentally different. <coughs> so therefore you need multiple pages. 
But that's the only caveat to this. And this has been worked on, uh, let, me, let me just give you a bit of a, a background, and then I'm going to drop back in and explain the page to you. So you understand where this has come from. It's taken me 17 years to get the strategy of the page. I wish I was taught this 17 years ago, it would save me a whole heap of pain along the way. Um, and this has been done in the big corporates, and it's been done in the big corporates for quite a while. Not to this extent, uh, but when I was back in Mars 12 years ago, Mars Inc. was doing strategy on a page 12 years ago. The only difference is they were doing it on an A3 page and the text font was 8. <laughs> right? So, and that, that, that's not what I encourage. As you can see, you can get it on a piece of A4. You've got a bit of space there as well for a little bit of maneuverability. So, we're talking text point 10 to 12 so you can read it and it's succinct. Okay? The other places I come across this was um, when I did my MBA over in UCLA in California, I was on the venture capital circuit. How many people have written a business plan? Try to raise money, okay? What page are people interested in? Page one. Okay, and page one is a bit of fluff actually because it's typically text. And this is where, again, in the venture capital circuit, if you can get this on a page, and I'll explain the page to you in a second, if you can get it on one single page, this is why we exist as a company, this is our vision, this is what we stand for, and here's the, this is the story of how we're going to get there going back to now, that's what venture capitalists want to see. I've been a business angel, I've worked in the business angel sector quite a lot still. And uh, again, angels, you want it on the page. It also comes back to where I've seen it work well was um, in virtual CEO and what I saw, saw within the business angel community is it's about engagement and about alignment with people in the company. Um, a worrying statistic that 85% of employees sur surveyed globally have no idea what their company stands for and what their company's doing because the purpose statements, look, the mission statements have gone mad. They don't mean anything anymore for most of the big companies. This is about true alignment. If you, can, if you as a leader have total clarity about what you stand for as a business and how you're gonna get there, then you can tell everybody in the company. And people have the attention span of goldfishes these days. So you need to, if you can't get it on a page, because people in your company probably remember three things. If you can't get it on a page, then you're not going to be able to align everybody behind that page. A lot easier, actually, in the, in the third sector to have a challenge than in the business sector, because you will actually have the inherent passion and motivation under, underlying your course, where some businesses are just, just seen as capitalistic businesses. So, let me just flip back a second and explain the page. So, we start over here with purpose. Now, we're going to go deep on that. That's the first exercise we're going to do. So, purpose, we're going to start off with easy questions. Why do you exist? What's this all about? And what are the different elements to it? And we're going to do a live exercise with that in a minute. So the purpose is where we start. If you do not know why you exist as a charity, and what your ultimate purpose is, then any strategy you're doing is not aligned to anything. So we start there. The vision is subtly different. The, the vision is the expression of the purpose. So what does it look like? What is it, when you've created this in three to five years time, what does it look like? And that could be lots of different things. It could be from brand awareness, it could be to, um, in the charitable sector, it could be about the number of people you're serving, the reach you're having. So it's just getting a clear expression of what that looks like. And the, the values piece, for me, in business, in commercial business, that's a sackable offence. Even more so important within the third sector. It's what do you stand for? What are your values and your principles? And everybody should be recruited against them. Now, where this goes interesting is volunteer base. Okay, now I've experienced this a lot. In, in business, it's a lot easier. You hire and recruit based on values. Okay, you get one bad apple in the mix, that can really affect the entire company, especially in smaller, smaller businesses, smaller charities. Uh, if you get one person who does not resonate with your values as a company, it can affect everything. Okay, a couple of nodding heads going around the room on that one. Now, the trouble is with volunteers, is you're not really recruiting them. Very difficult to say no to volunteers. Sorry, you don't put our value base. And what you end up is having a mix of people and then managing volunteers, hardest job in the world. So values in the third sector is something which, is, uh, which I want to go a little bit deeper in because that's a big challenge. And that's where I found people and trustees on boards and volunteers that really shouldn't be there. They didn't resonate the values of the charity in any way, shape or form and actually hindering the charity, the charity where the charity can go. The three boxes up here, we're not going to have time, there's only so much we can do in a couple of hours today, but 
unique selling proposition? That's what makes you unique as a, as a charity. What's your, what's your edge? The, the, the defined market space where you operate, and down here is the company promise. What is the promise you are making? We're all making promises every single day. What is your promise? You're making a promise to your trustees, or you're making a promise to your to your to whoever you're selling. Be very clear on that, because that promise is where the power is. And now we move into strategy. So there's a line there. Once you've done that, the left-hand side, that doesn't fundamentally change. You need to review it yearly. That's your kind of yearly strategic review. But that doesn't change. That is your guiding light, and that is what you align strategy to. And we're going to come to what strategy is in a minute. And then the next, these three elements here are just the three levels of strategy, and it's long-term, medium-term, short-term. Let's not overcomplicate things. And we're going to go into what those timelines look like today. We are going to so we're going to do a deep exercise on the yearly because that's where the power lies. So we're going to go on a deep exercise on defining what your yearly strategic drivers are. And up here, these are the numbers. This is where I find the charity sector is the weakest, which is key performance indicators. How are you measuring your success of your strategy? First of all, do you understand your strategy and are you clear? And then, if you, if you now know how you're going to your strategy is going to be executed, how are you going to measure it to make sure you are on track? And this is, yes, this is revenue and profitability, honestly, but this is a lot more clever, subtle numbers. And it has to be a number. Because you can, you can bullshit strategy a little bit. You can't bullshit numbers. Okay? And we're going to look at that. And particularly within the third sector and the charity sector, how do you measure in your sector? And what's the powerful numbers that are going to make a difference? Okay? So that's the page. And that's what, you've got the page. Um, after today, I will send this out. This is a, an Excel spreadsheet. There's a m number of pages behind it. I'll give it to Jason, so you'll have, you have a soft copy so you can actually move into your own page, okay? Uh, just obviously didn't want to give it to people during the session because I'll lose people on laptops and uh, iPads and we don't want to do that. So I'll just give it to you after. Great, thank you. Right, so let's get into it. Now that's what it looks like when it's filled in. Uh, you can't see that just as well because it's, uh, this is actually the, I sit on the International Advisory Board for Global Angels. So Global Angels is a, 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 a global children's charity run by Molly Beddingfield. Now, this is their page, um, and it's incredibly powerful when you get, get into it. I've had to strip the numbers out for confidentiality reasons there. But just to show this works in charities, it's being run in charities live. And actually, I find, to be honest with you, it's the bringing alive bit, which we're going to talk about later. The first thing is getting the strategy, but then making it exciting and bringing it alive for everybody. That's where it gets exciting. And that, it's very hard not to get pumped about that. And that's the whole point of charity. If you're doing the right thing with the right purpose, you've got the passion and the, and the whole purpose behind it all. It's about bringing it alive and making sure you're doing the right things. So, now it's done. Now you've got to start thinking. Now I'm going to challenge everybody in the room today, so it's up to you. Be quiet in the morning, we'll answer your questions, and then I'm going to actually pick you up later and ask you the hard ones personally, or you can get interactive right from the beginning. You'll call on that one, okay? So, what is strategy? And you're not allowed to answer, Mike, because I know you know the answer. No rights and wrong answers? It's, it's a plan. It's a plan. Okay, that's a good one. <coughs> it's a framework for actions. It's where you're heading. Where you're heading, yeah? Yeah. People's got a strategy in the room. A really clear one. I know you do. I feel just cheating. Well, the rest of you like now, so I'm not putting my hand up. He's going to have a go. Yeah. I'm going to put maybe add analysis to that. Analysis? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Uh, analyzing situations, markets. Okay. See, this is where strategy is one of the most misused words in business, in my own opinion. It's like three blind men trying to describe an elephant. Depends on where the man is. So one's at the tail, going this elephant, that feels like a string thing with a fluffy thing on the bottom. It's like a pom pom. There's another guy at the other end going, no, it's like a snake. It's like a strong snake thing as he's feeling the trunk. And there's another one in the middle feeling the leg going, I think it looks like a tree to me. Because the essence of strategy is it's the whole elephant. The people are, depending on where your background is, you're taking it from different parts. So again, analysis is, is, if you're coming from that element of it, you'll be classifying strategy as the analysis part. How many people's got finance background? There you go, I'll ask that question this week. 
Because if you came from, if you ask a finance group, because I you know, speak in business leader forums, you ask people with finance groups, it's all about, it's all about numbers. How many people have got sales and marketing backgrounds? So you'd be taking more of a slant towards the sales and marketing element of strategy. Okay? Nothing's wrong with that, but understand that that's sales and marketing strategy, and finance strategy is something different. What we're talking about today is the overarching big stuff, and it'll have elements of all of it. And the question is, which elements are relevant to you? Um, so the actual, that is the dictionary definition of strategy. But it's a plan for obtaining a specific major result. Now let's focus on the word major today. In this room today, we're talking about major. Right? Now, size is irrelevant. I don't care what major is, as long as it's major to you. So if you're a one-man, one-woman band, major will be different to if you're a multi-global, multinational, global corporation. But major is major. And, and this is where tactic, the dictionary definition of tactic is a plan for obtaining a desired end result. Do you see why people mix up strategy and tactics? Are we allowed to disagree with what's up there? Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Or not? But this is about interaction, this is an interactive environment, so please go for it. I don't think a strategy is a plan. I think the plan comes out of the strategy. Okay. Just so give me your strategy. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm not a charity, so that's a bit difficult, but a strategy is, is an overarching goal, really, where you're headed. And the plan is, okay, this is how we're going to get there. We're going to do this in this. Okay. And you'll see from the page, you, you are right to extend, I'm not going to disagree with you. So if you go back up here, what you'll find is the core strategy, this is the bigger stuff, which is essentially the goals kind of thing, which is this is what we're trying to achieve, which is still a strategic driver. And then the plan is the strategy behind that, which yeah. can also be mixed with tactics. I think if you've just got a plan, you haven't always got a clear strategy. Correct. Yeah. And this is exactly why the page is coming. If you haven't got a purpose, a vision and values, if you don't have the overarching theme, then you're not going to have any... If you've just got a plan, then what's the plan linked to? Yeah. It's got to be linked to major goals, it's got to be major, linked to major... So ultimately, it's semantics here. You could actually call all of that, that you could call the purpose and the vision strategy if you wanted to call it that. This is where semantics in business, this is being... People are calling vision and purpose strategy. People are calling strategy vision. People are calling it. So there's no rights or wrongs. Whatever, whatever's comfortable for you. But ultimately, the components of the page all need to be there. I don't care what you call them, as long as it works for you. Okay. So, um, but I'm not going to argue with the dictionary because that's what the dictionary says. What strategy is. So, um, and that's why I kind of quoted the dictionary because go go argue with the dictionary. Not me. Um, so. Now let's talk about bad strategy and good strategy, and then we're going to get into it. Now, I've found a lot of bad strategy over the years, okay? People who are claiming strategy is, they're claiming a mission statement and they're saying it's strategy. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's a mission statement. A mission statement is typically bad too. So, first bad strategy is failure to face the problem. Think about the problems you're facing and think if you're really dealing with them with your strategy. A lot of things <coughs> I find with, with Charities, it's about actually our strategy is we just got to raise more cash. We've got to get more funding. <clears throat> Whereas actually, it might not be the funding. If you fundamentally don't have a sustainable model behind that, the funding is not the issue. It's your business model that's the issue. So if you're not facing the fundamental problems in your business, then that's bad strategy. The next thing is a goal is not strategy. A goal is a goal. And this is where I do disagree with you somewhat. It's that, you know, there's a goal and there's a strategy. The, the goal is a goal. So if your strategy is, we're going to raise a million pounds, or we're going to do a million pound turnover, that is not a strategy. It's a goal. And that's where, this is, this is where semantics get mixed up. Because a lot of people are goal setters. A lot of people are, have goals in business. A lot of people don't, actually. That's fundamentally wrong. But then, if that is your strategy, there is no plan to achieve it. So that's bad strategy in my, in my humble opinion. The to-do list strategy, this is people can go away for away days and you just, all this stuff on the wall, this is all the stuff we're going to do, cobble it together in a massive list, that's our strategy. No, that's a to-do list. <laughs> it's very different. Um, and then you've got the blue sky strategy, which is we are going to serve everybody in the world, we're going to be amazing, and you know, it all sounds great, but there's absolutely nothing underpinning it. Okay? Just start to think about these. You might recognise a few of these in the companies you've worked for, companies you're currently in. Um, and just be aware, don't do it. And the, the last one is fluff masquerading as expertise. 
used a lot in bigger strategies, in bigger companies, a lot used a lot of bigger charities. This is one, I'm not going to name who it is, but it's a very large international bank. Customer-centric financial growth was their underpinning strategy. Okay? Customer-centric, we focus on the customer's financial growth to grow their money. They're back. Well done. <laughs> and that was a multi-billion dollar corporation, and that was their fundamental strategy. So even the big boys can get this wrong. Okay? So, and it's that. It's, as you get into bigger companies, the mission statements, there's all buzzwords around it and slots of fluff. And actually, if you, ask, you, if you can't go down and ask the person sitting in the post room, what is the, what is the strategy of that company? And if they can't tell you, you haven't got your strategy right. It needs to be understandable. And it needs to be clear, clear speaking. I don't do jargon. It's, I think jargon's uh, irrelevant. Um, now, so what's a good strategy? Well, a good strategy will address the critical issues in the company. That's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what's the critical issues in your company right now. It's a plan for a major result. Think major again major for you. Uh, it's aligned to the day-to-day. -day. If, if you are putting a strategy in place, a goal in place, a large vision or purpose in place, and you cannot take a step towards it today, it's probably not the right strategy for your company. You need to be able to move into it. Some of them are part. So some of them, the, the bigger stuff, the three-year stuff, you have to, it just sits out there and there's nothing you can do on it yet. But you need to be able to execute most of your strategy in the day. So we've got to bring it down to now. Otherwise, it's just fluff again. If you can't do something towards it, and it doesn't mean you don't have to move into it and start investing money into it, it could be asking the right questions, getting some of the right answers, exploring it a little bit further. Um, Align to purpose is key. Now, I think in the charity sector, this is where you have the biggest advantage. It's because your purpose and your passion is going to be pretty fundamental and core. Where actually, in a lot of businesses I go into, they're only there because they want to make money. Now, I want you to break up into twos. Now, we're going to start to get into it. Right? We're going to start to get into the page, and we're going to build three elements of the page up over the sessions this morning. Um, so I would like to choose another person. How many have we got? Two, four, six, six, seven. Jason, can you jump into a two? Yeah. So we've got an even, even thing. And if you can come around with me and Mike and help us. So you call on me or Mike if you want any help, because it's important that you get under this. So if you've got any questions or any concerns, then bring us in and, and we're here. So, so we've got 15 minutes. I want you to go deep on purpose. And I would humbly suggest you need to have a balance in your purpose. Remember, this is the question, why do you exist as a charity? If you can't get this one right and the different elements of this one right, any strategy you hang off that is going to be pretty irrelevant or skewed. Okay? Now, in the business world, the way I see it go down a lot is they're doing it for financial gain, following opportunity, and, I, and sometimes adding service value. Sometimes if you haven't got the service or value in there, that's why it's, you can actually make a quick buck, but it's not sustainable. Okay? Now, with you guys, and it's interesting, sometimes a lot of the guys I work with, they didn't have an inherent passion for what they do, and we've changed it. A number of them sold a number of companies, and we've actually gone and doing what they love to do. Now, for you guys, it's going to be different. Because I think there's bags of this. Okay? That's your strength. This is your competitive advantage right here. And you're typically following opportunity because in a charity there needs to be well, there needs to be an opportunity to be able to serve and do good. Otherwise, again, your model is going to be fundamentally flawed. And instead of service and value, which we talk about in the commercial world, we're talking about philanthropic gain or philanthropic service. It could be still service or value. Now, here's the bit I want you to really think about. Now, for any you're all leaders, okay. So all the different elements here is you will deserve to live the lifestyle that you choose. Let's just get that one out on the table. Now, in order to live that lifestyle that you choose as leaders in charities, you need to earn a certain amount of money. And I don't care what that number is, but you've got to decide what that number is. And if your charity model cannot generate that amount of money, I would suggest you are in the wrong charity or in the wrong model. Because we've got to get this hung around numbers. We've got to become this. We were talking earlier, weren't we, about the financial, the financial models behind it and, and real business behind it. This is what we've got to get to. Okay? Now, Judy said earlier, you said again, you're looking at now setting up a charity model, which is a business, but can earn money. Yes. Good. Perfect. How much? That's the question you've got. Don't ask that question, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Think about this in this exercise. Because let me give you 
an analogy in, in charity terms, Mother Teresa. Do you think she did a lot of good in this world? I think we all, I think we can all pretty much say Mother Teresa was a pretty amazing person, correct? Do you think she had passion for what she did? Was there an opportunity to serve the children in Bangladesh? Yeah? And do you think she, the service and, and the value and the philanthropic aid she gave made a massive difference in that? Did she live the lifestyle that she chose and she loved? Did that need a lot of money? Apparently not. Now, I'm not saying you all have to live like Mother Teresa. That is not the point. But for Mother Teresa, that was enough. It still got quite some money. She did. Absolutely she right. Global diplomat, ultimately. Absolutely right. Yeah. But she didn't hurt. She had enough. And this is in business context. I don't think a lot of business, a lot of the guys I work with in multiple million companies don't know what enough is. Because <coughs> um, most of them already got enough, and they don't quite realise it yet. In charity, I would just find out what that enough is. Once we know that number, we can work the strategy off it. Because if we don't know what that number is, then the model's flawed from the very beginning. So that's the bit I want to challenge you. I'm mean, normally challenging people down on the passion piece and the service piece, right, in businesses. With you, it's a complete flip. I think I'm challenging you on the, the, the finance and the lifestyle piece and making sure everything else is aligned to it. So think about the five different elements. We've got 15 minutes to get into twos, get a break out the next, next um, the five different elements, and then when we come back, I'm going to ask for a bit of feedback and any, any, things, any challenges you found or any questions you've got. Okay? So 15 minutes, go. <laughs> Now, don't panic, you probably haven't got all the answers. Fair? <laughs> This is, remember, we've got a couple of hours and I'm here to challenge you and I'm here to ask you know, some pertinent questions, some of which you need to go away with, all right? Now, um, let's have a little bit of a debate around this because different things are coming up in different parts of the room which I think you all are going to be sharing on. Let's start at the back of the room. So Gabrielle and Ruth are talking about, it was interesting, is this about me as a person or is this about charity as a business? Okay? What did you come up with in the end when you talked around that? Describe that to us. Yeah, well, I think that's a question I was asking about. The example you were giving was very much about think, us thinking about ourselves and our own lifestyle and whether we should be thinking about that or our organisation. Um, I think for me, I, I'm happy with quite a lot of those things. So I, I sort of took that that actually I was quite in line with what we were doing. I thought that was quite positive. Yeah, that is. And that's, that's brilliant. If you can, we're talking over here with um, Vijay, who was saying just now that lifestyle, financial, tech, that means we can focus wholly on the bottom bit. That's, that's the answer, right? What we're looking for is if there's a gap in the financial bit, and this is where I think it's tragic, where people start off with the bottom three, okay? Huge passion, huge service, carry on, you know, drive, 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 drive. And what happens is if the financial bit doesn't come and they're not serving their lifestyle, they end up being poor, in debt, or whatever as a result of them serving their passion, they will fall out of their passion, and then they will not be able to serve. And that's why I said we have to keep an eye on it. And also fascinating because you're region, you, you are Birmingham, as you said to me earlier, right? Yeah. Because you are a regional, a regional part of a much bigger relate. So relate's obviously national. So in the context of the page, in theory terms, relate national should have a page, which should be the national guidance on, on a strategy on a page. Whereas each region would have subtle differences. So it's about personalizing the mission and the purpose to the individual regions. 
A lot of it will be the same because ultimately we make, as a, as a company, the purpose, the vision and the value should be very similar for all regions of relate. Mm -hmm. However, it's about adapting the, to, to the subtleties of the different regions. And strategy will be different for the different regions, correct? So London strategy will be different to Berlin. Yeah. That's why you have to have different pages for fundamentally different businesses. So that was a good one, I thought. Um, and the other thing was, when we were talking to, um, <coughs> Sir Gabriel was talking about the, because uh, he's got six, seven trustees, did you say? Uh, six. Six trustees. So who's responsible for the purpose? <laughs> right? Well, somebody has to be. Someone needs to lead it. And I would suggest it's you today, because you're sitting here and knows that I'm clear what we're talking about. Um, but it's getting that now. I work with a lot of boards. The MD or the CEO needs to own and drive the purpose, but then get buy-in from everybody else. Everybody on the board should be totally bought into the purpose. If not, then they shouldn't be on the board. Or you need to be asking some pertinent questions around the place. But someone needs to own it. In business, it's a lot easier when you've got a business owner, because the business owner who owns the business, it is their purpose, ultimately, and everyone's aligned to it. Okay? When you get more complex and strategies, more complex strategies, it gets a little bit more complicated. But the purpose doesn't, the purpose statement is still the same, but I've seen it work in, um, in the business where there's, there's four different board members where each have their own page. That's yeah. subtly different. The, un the, the fundamental <laughs> elements of the company remain the same, but the lifestyle and financial pieces are different for the individuals. Um, and what you see, it's, it's beyond what we're going to do <coughs> today, but the page cascades. Yeah. So this is a strategic page at group level or divisional level. Below that, you go into project pages, right? Which is the next cascade down. And some of the, the bigger companies I work with, they've cascaded down to individuals. So we've got people on the page. Every individual has their own page. And the power with that is, um, if I can go up to where's the page gone on my page, is that they, half of the purpose and the vision usually remain exactly the same. So they're totally tied into the vision and purpose of the company. The values are exactly the same, but we personalise the values to what it means to them as individuals. And we put in what their individual vision is. Because it might be to, to get the car or to get the house or to whatever. And it's personalising the strategy to each individual in the company. And that gives total alignment. That's pretty powerful when you get down to that level of growing down. But that takes a bit of time. Okay. So, who else do we have? Judy? Judy, so you, you didn't know your number. Talk to us about that. Yeah, we had a talk about it. But, um, for, for myself, I reckon it's like a basic Okay, there you go. Okay. Um, for the business, I want to remember the basic care. Okay. In the first year. In the first year. Okay. Now, that's a good starting point, right? This is where I go, this is, you're not unique, this is why I bring it up. This is brilliant. She's, she's asked you know, the right question, I don't know my number, right? Now, how do you get your number? You get your personal number, very simply. What is your mortgage? What is your bills? What is your food? What's the lifestyle you're choosing? That's for me, adventure. That's what adventure costs a bit of money. That's my, I don't do fast cars, or I'm not interested in cars. I love my home, I love adventure. That's it, that's my lifestyle. I know exactly how much that costs. So that's, that's the lifestyle bit. You've got it nailed already, Way We were talking about that earlier, so you know. As soon as you know what your lifestyle is, and you're happy in that lifestyle, you know the number. The number on the business, needs to incorporate that, okay? Because one of the KPIs will be CEO or MD, wage. Different in charity, but it would be wage, but in, you know, dividends, tax structures, we're not going to talk only about that in the commercial world. But for you, that is one of the number, because if you cannot serve that number within your business, then the business is not serving you. Is this, this payback in other terms, presumably, uh, I, I think? Some people might not be pitching for a number, but they might want the training. Give me some training. Yeah, so oh, if I'm in this charity for five years, yeah. I can achieve my professional qualification for that. So fund that for me. Might not come in my pay packet, Perfect. but it might come. And that should be that. And that's why I call lifestyle. Yeah. Right? Lifestyle yeah. covers whatever you choose that to be. If it's education and your highest value is on learning, yeah. there's a money, there's a number associated to learning. Yeah. Build it in. Okay. That's why I don't, you know, don't use a, a wage term or anything like that, because money is a motivator, that's a whole different topic. But um, it's about hygiene factors, it's about what people value. And everybody's gonna be different. Value them in different ways. But remember, we're talking about top of company here. Mm -hmm. Valuing yourselves as leaders first. 
If the leader is valued, the leader is living the lifestyle they choose and earning the right amount of money, they're able to lead fearlessly doing what they love to do. And that's what a leader has to be. Because if a leader's sitting at the top of the company and is bitching and moaning about not earning enough, or not having a lifestyle or getting themselves into debt or anything else in the background, that will not serve the charity. And that, will, that energy will filter down. This is why the, that's why I start at the top. Mm. It always has to start at the top. Um, the other one was then... Oh yeah, that, so Ali asked a very pertinent question, which was, what if you're not passionate about what you do? <laughs> what do you reckon? Do you, you obviously tend to answer that one in there, though, what you think? <laughs> Yeah, it was, more, it was more about um, whether you do have the passion and um, yeah, you do have the passion and you have the purpose, but you you're not living um, the lifestyle um, that you would like or you want to. That's it. That's the balance you've got to find. Mm. And some people, this is a question. Can, one, you're in the wrong job in the wrong place, so you need to move somewhere else now. This goes, now you've got to be careful with this one. Um, so we've got to be careful because I mean, there are accountants, aren't they, in this building? Mm -hmm. Is it accountants? Yeah, they're outside. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's just, so, let's not use accountants, let me use bankers. Okay? Bankers have created a lifestyle for themselves and they earn a lot of money. Are they giving a service? Debatable, some of them are, but lack of passion. Now, I know this. I, I, <laughs> I studied corporate finance all my MBA, a lot of my mates are in the banking industry. Now, some of them love it. They're adding huge service and value in what they're doing. They're funding big businesses. They're making a massive difference in what they do. Fantastic. A lot of them are trapped in the financial lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You ask them what they really want to do, they want to oh God, they want to set up a surf shop in, South, in, in Cornwall. Mm -hmm. The guy's got several million in the bank. He could go and do it tomorrow, but he's trapped himself in the lifestyle he's chosen. He's a bloody good coach to go and sort them out. I'm not a coach, I have a lot of patience. But, uh, you know, but that is what's, that's, the, that's the gap. It works both ways. But simultaneously, if you're then given a whole heap of passion and service, but you're not getting rewarded for it, that passion and service may fizzle and die, which would be sad. That's just what I just feel. My, my humble opinion is we need to mix them all. And as long as I'm, there is not focusing on the top two, in business, I'm not focusing on the top two, I'm focusing on the bottom three. Mm. Because you're normally in business, I'm working with business leaders, the money bit's kind of sorted and they've got the life that result of that. Still, it's reason the question. So it's interesting in this dynamic, it's a flip to that. Mm -hmm. Anything else came out for anyone? Anything else anyone wants to feedback? Food for thought. Food for thought. Right. Now, you've got a bit of work to do all that. So, you know, you can see the different elements. You can see you might have multiple pages, right? You see how this all fills out. Now vision, I'm not going to go into vision, I haven't got the time to go into vision, but vision is the expression of that purpose. Okay? So once you get clear on the different elements of your purpose, vision might be the house in the country, um, uh, it could be a small house in the country, it could be a big house in the country, it could be whatever the lifestyle vision is. If it's your company, it's your charity, it's your vision. If it's somebody else's charity, then the vision is more about the charity. You can have your own page, which is something different. Okay? Um, but the vision might be touching 100,000 people in the local area and making a difference in their lives. The vision could be um, central offices funded by somebody else that we can actually touch and integrate. And it, the vision could be whatever it might be. Make it big. This is longer term stuff. And interestingly, I challenge all of you, which we're going to come on to a little bit later, think a little bit bigger in your purpose and your vision. Your purpose and your vision is the big stuff. Major. Remember major. Okay? Okay, yeah, just worth saying that point about when you're formulating the vision and the purpose for a big organisation, involving the people in the organisation in formulating that. Um, so. Get the point, you know, you're right, you write it for yourself, but you've got to write it for your organisation. and then you start, you, yeah. They, they, trying to then sell it to them is difficult if you're actually involved in formulating it. In the you've first got place. to start somewhere, I agree with you 100%. The CEO, whoever's the leader, like this is a CEO group, right? So I'm talking the CEOs where you run the regions, right? It's got to start with you. Got to start somewhere, and you can formulate in your mind. Now, you do not go, got the purpose, everybody, there it is. So, everybody, align to that purpose, please. Thank you very much. Okay? That's not good. That's not, that's not what I'm doing. So, you, you bang on this. But you've got to start it somewhere. You've got to ask the pertinent questions. And actually, this is the framework to hang it off to be able to bring it into the board meeting, the trustee meeting, whatever. So, right, guys, 
I saw this Welsh guy speaking, you know, he's Welsh, but we let him off for that, uh, about purpose. Um, and here are the elements what I think we need to discuss. I've given it the first go. This is what my, my opinions are. I really want all your feedback, because I think if we can all align to a common purpose between all of us, I think that's going to be incredibly powerful. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you, it, it filters, it's that like cascade thing. You've got it, the CEO's got to be the first person to initiate it. You bring in the board next, then the middle man, which you get that crowd to top down, then you engage with the middle management, and then you filter it down through the company, and it's got to keep simple. Can I just add to that? I think it goes one stage further, because one of the biggest problems that's come out in the London groups over the last six months has been CEOs of charities saying, how do I manage my trustees? Yeah. And I think the real problem with that is, is that too many trustees are trustees because it's fashionable to be a trustee. Oh, look, I've been asked to be a trustee of a charity. Let me be a trustee. And because they, they've done it for the wrong reasons and they don't have the purpose, they still nevertheless feel they want to do something. But because they don't understand the purpose, they interfere. Absolutely right. Uh, and therefore, Absolutely you have trustees right. that are going in the wrong direction. And so we spent a lot of time. We had a whole session one day on how do you manage your trustees. So there's two elements to that, which is, uh, anyone resonate with that? Definitely. Yeah? <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Not just yes, definitely. Right? There's two things, because it comes into purpose. If everyone's, aligned, if everyone's aligned to purpose, and the trustees are aligned to purpose, and trustees are selected based off purpose, it also links into values. Well, if I can say that, we've got the chair, chair of trustees in one of the at a, at a trustee meeting to ask every single trustee whether they're aligned with the purpose, three of them resigned. There you go. And do you think that's a good thing? Brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And this is it. When you're clear on your purpose and your values, it's very clear who shouldn't be in your company. Now, I do this in the commercial sector, so it's a lot easier in the commercial sector. As a result of me working with companies, within several months, people have gone. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they're usually, excuse the word, terrorists. They're in the company, and they're terrorizing the company. They are, they're bringing the company from the inside down. Right? You know who I'm talking about. You've probably encountered them somewhere along the way. Right? Uh, or they're just not, and it's, if someone's sitting in the company and they're hating what they do, they're miserable at what they do, they're not serving themselves. For God's sake, and when we manage people out, do it in the nicest possible way, you don't think it's working around here, is it? No, okay, well, why don't you go and do what you want? Give them a bit of coaching, give them a bit of guidance, and, and go off on their path. If they want to go and terrorize someone else, but they're just, oh, well, like that, then go, just do it somewhere else. We don't want you around here, okay? So, bang on, absolutely bang on. And this is why this is so important. If you start here and you align from here, then it's incredibly powerful. And by this time you came to the end of the session today and you start to see how this builds up, you see the power of it when we're talking about bringing it alive. Okay? Good. Let's now, I am going to talk for just 10 minutes before we have the break. Break's at 11.30, yeah? When you're ready. When you're ready. Yeah, that's fine. So 11.30, because I want to uh, sort of start the exercise formula in your mind pre the break. And there's no time to come around here. Thank you, time's coming. Okay. Um, and we're going, to, so we're going to start to move into strategic timing. Now, we're going to talk about the year, with the one year thing in a minute, right? But the, I'm going to give you the three powerful elements of the page, and you have to work around the rest in your own time. Um, now, strategic timing. Long term, medium term, short term. Just, just decide what that means to you. I don't put rules around this, because it totally depends. It depends on how big you are. It depends on what industry you're in. It depends on how much change you're undergoing right now. Uh, I have social media companies who are, their long term is one year. Mm -hmm. right? Good luck if you think you're going to define strategy beyond a year of social media. Because <laughs> it ain't going to happen. I have a logistics company actually in Birmingham, a big 50 million pound company. Logistics is a little bit more stayed, 10 year long term strategy. Down to a quarter for them in the short term. Most people, um, unless you're particularly large and particularly clunky, the, the short term will be a month. Because it's about the power of the now. If you start to go beyond a month, I, and I've done it with a number of companies where I've done a quarter and it's too long. There's a reason why the academy works, because it's monthly. And that strategic rhythm keeps you on track. Because so if you give yourself an action, when it comes down to action, what does it need to achieve this quarter? You'll probably achieve it, but you'll do it in month three. Right? So let's just reduce that ability to, to procrastinate a little bit. Um, the one which I, I think shouldn't move, but again, I'm open to this, it's the middle one, it's usually a year. 
And if it's not, if, if your year is the long term, I'm fine with that, because the year is, is the powerful one. You can do an awful lot in a year. It's a very powerful strategic time frame. That's how you break that down. So I'm, if you want to do one year, one quarter, one month, I'm fine with that. If you want to do five years, the typical one is three to five. One year, one month. Okay? So just, just think what, whatever suits you. Now, everyone's on different timelines. I'm not going to go with that. Anyone got an NLP in the room? Okay? Because the NLP is, everyone's got very different timelines. Actually, Jason and I had this conversation, and, it's, uh, and everyone's different. My wife cannot see. I, I'm, I do strategy, so my timeline is very much in the three years. It's the three years, one year, one month. That's just the way I work, and that's natural to me. Um, my wife, so I'm planning the life and the ventures and stuff out there. My wife thinks I'm mental. You know, she just can't see beyond the month. In fact, she struggles to see past the week. She's a doctor, an any doctor. So guess what? She's in the net. And you'd hope she would be, because if you went into accident emergency, you don't really want her head to be a month ahead, do you really? So, but she's very, very, and just understand that. Because you might be there with your people, and you might be the visionary. If you're a CEO, you typically will be. Where you're like, oh, this is where we're going in the three years. A lot of people won't give a shit. <laughs> right? So this is why we have the three different elements of strategy. Because the whole thing is powerful, but you've emphasized different elements of it to different people. For the people who can't see out here, just watch over that and just go, in this year, this is what we're doing. People who are more visionary, need to be a bit more focused on it. People who really go into a month, this is what we're doing this month. So it enables you to um, execute. Okay, now, so I'm a bit of a mountaineer, as you probably tell from my, um, and I, I like to bring a little bit of adventure to, to highlight this. 2014, I'm doing Everest. That's Everest, right? It's a bit of a nasty mountain, really. But it's taken me seven years to get there by the time from when I started to when I climb it. Now, some people in business and charity decide to just have a crack at Everest. Okay? Now, some people actually get away with it. Luck, lucky them. I, however, like to be a little bit strategic in my planning because I know that I could kill myself on that mountain. Like you could kill yourself setting up your first charity. Right? <laughs> Now, the way I did it, the vision and the purpose is, the, is Everest. That's the big stuff. Now, the one year strategy is a little bit short term. Now, for me, it's actually something different this year because I've got a little bit of girls. Um, but I started off with Kosciuszko, which is a small mountain in Australasia. It's the Seven Summits, so I'm doing the Seven Summits, basically. And then the mountains got bigger through Elbrus in Russia, Kilimanjaro got bigger into Alaska, and then up to 7,000 meter peaks in Aconcagua. During that journey, my skills changed. I had to learn how to use ice axes and crampons. I had to learn to, to use different kits on different mountains. I had to learn how to fuel differently. Same journey in business and charity. It's gonna change. We're looking at the big stuff, so your purpose statement is the big stuff. The trick is breaking it down to what's the mountain I'm doing this year. Um, but what's major for 2012? Now, so that's in this context, unless you decide that long term is out here because you're going through so much change. If you're a startup, if you're kind of really new at what you're doing, your long term might be a year because there's so much going on that you, you, you're going to have to adapt. Um, but for the purpose of this, I'm just going to assume it's the middle one, right? So the middle one in your room, that's the one year. Now, what we're going to do when we come back is we're going to look at the different elements of strategy. Now, you've got these different elements of purpose. Now, some of those will feed into the strategy. Okay. Now, if you don't want to know what your number is, financial strategy is going to be quite important. Okay, knowing what that number is, and some of the actions in the now might be go away, do full research, and totally understand what my number is. Okay. Now, there's different elements to strategy, and charity is going to be subtly different, but you've got to start thinking about all elements. Now, I started off saying where to use finance. You know, put the hands up. Your financial strategy needs to be part of your major plan. <coughs> now, that's going to mean different things to every single one of you. Think about what that means for you. Is it fundraising? Is it setting up business interests on the side and making sure the businesses fund the charity? Is it CIC vehicles? Is it um, bringing in volunteers? It's different for every single one of you. But financial strategy is going to be key because we're going to have to start measuring some of this in a minute. So think about finance. I'm going to challenge you all the financey bit again, because I think where 
a lot of you will be weaker. There's nothing, no, there's no criticism or anything there. It's, it's actually 80% of the clients I'm working with in the commercial world, that is where they're weakest. Fair? Because not many people are financial directors. Well, no, I'm not going to go there. Um, especially if, again, in the campus building. But they actually make some of the best leaders, people who have come out of the charity world, because they really do understand the numbers. Okay? And that's where most people's blind spot happens. And that's where, sadly, a charity can go under overnight. And it's because they didn't have the right number. And it can come and bite you very, very quickly. So let's just get that one fixed as a, as a strategy, number one. Um, look at uh, sales. Now, sales is a charity. Well, yeah, you've got to sell yourself. How are you selling yourself? How are you getting, how are you getting funding? <coughs> it's sales as content. You might call it something differently, but it's still there. Marketing is still there. But it's done very differently. So look at these different elements. Uh, the customer service, it could be trustee, it could be volunteer service, it could be whatever you want it to be. Look at, um, look at operations. What is your systems? Does your system support your growth? If you're planning on huge growth, have you even thought about the systems element underpinning that? Major stuff here in the year. Now, it'll be different. Um, oh, don't do the F word yet. Oh, that's later. Uh, <laughs> It's going to be different for you guys, but I'm going to be talking exit up here. How many people have an exit strategy? One. Good. I can promise you all one thing, you will all exit. It's the question of whether you die or not. Right? Oh, I can't help you if you die. I can help you if you're living. Because, and this is where I see charities are most vulnerable, is they're not putting succession planning in place. If individuals die. And Molly Beddingfield is Global Angels. We've got a big problem. If she walks under a bus tomorrow, that the global charity will go down. Now we're working on succession planning now. So think about the people. So you may be CEO, who's going to be CEO if you're not there? Is this a family thing? Sometimes it goes down generations, and that gets complicated. It's complicated in business, let alone within charities. So I'm going to throw that little challenge out there, because it might be that over here, exit for you guys will be different, <coughs> but I'd like to use, and I use this for a lot of businesses as well, which is a choice to exit myself personally. So it runs itself sustainably, right? Because if the charity is totally reliant on you, you do not have a sustainable charity. Now, what does that mean in the midterm? Well, if that's right here, then right here in the one year strategic drivers, you've got to start getting a little management sorted. Because if you don't have any form of manager or any form of, and it might be a three year, four year, five year plan to get people coming through, but you've got to start that. Because I come into companies who are trying to exit it's too late. Mm. And actually, we just don't want to wait. It's going to take another two years to, for us to restructure the thing to be able to make it exitable. Now, it's different in charities, but it isn't. You know, it's the same problem under different guys. And just start thinking about sustainability, exit, and what that looks like. Good for you, getting the exit plan in place. What does yours look like then? Well, I was hoping to exit before I died, didn't I? That was that's the plan, that's a good plan. <laughs> I thought that was a strategic plan. That's, a good, that's definitely a good plan. <laughs> and and that, this is the thing, it's... Once you've said... A lot of people, when I say that to people, it's the first time they've heard it. That's fine, just take that away, log it, and also look at... It depends on how you structure it. If you structure it as more like a business, like a CIC or whatever, uh, if one of you dies, if one of the shareholders dies, it can leave a huge hole or what happens to those shares, right? Because the number of you were talking, you've got business and you've got charity interests, okay? Now, this is just hypothetical. Four board members owning the business part, to, which is funds a charity, everyone aligned to purpose, everyone aligned to values, to strategies, flawlessly executed. One dies, now who owns a quarter of the company? The wife. Could be. Could be brother, could be cat's father, home. could be cat's home. <laughs> It could be somebody, and it probably is going to be somebody who's not aligned to the purpose and values. Shareholders group. If you put these things in place, 
That nightmare scenario can be fixed by simple things like shareholders agreements, double option agreements, buybacks, simple little things. Just think about it, it's strategic. Okay? Now, with a passion element, right? We talked about passion. If you've got that passion aspect, you might not want to exit yourself fully, you might not want to sell it, which is not what we're talking about here, but you might want to move yourself up to chair, chairman, chairwoman position, but the whole thing runs itself without you. And you can just tinker around, not causing too much disruption, clearly. That's a whole different leadership thing. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Mm. Can I also say, I think you need to move yourself on sometimes. If you're an entrepreneur, and you not, don't necessarily make a good manager of a business. Do you know an entrepreneur that has made a good manager? <laughs> uh, no, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and this is where if you know what you're good at and you're clear on that, see, all the, the commercial companies I'm working with have got exit plans in place, three year exit plans, because I can guarantee within it's shiny penny syndrome. Within three years, they're off to the next like shiny penny. Mm -hmm. That means we have to put the management structure in place to run it. And a lot of them don't want to sell those companies because they love them, but they're off doing the next thing. Mm. There's no reason you can't do that in the charity world. Because I'm hoping this business will be part of my exit strategy because I don't want to keep running the main There you go. I want to develop it in different ways, but not keep strategy. running Strategy. <laughs> so you, you'll put an exit in the vision on this page. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I, I do. So when I do um, exit, can it can be part of purpose or it can be part of vision. Some people are very visual in context on exit, mm -hmm. and I've, I've got some guys where their, their vision is exiting with a clean set of heels, mm -hmm. with like two million pounds in my back pocket. That's their vision. They can see themselves dancing out the door. You know, it's, it's vision is visual, right? It has to be a visual context. Other people, it's purpose. It is the purpose is to set up a, a sustainable, self-running business. Which, which generates X and, and, and looks after itself. Yeah. And it, vision, vision and purpose are, are two sides of the same coin. It's just how to express it. Yeah. And the reason I use both, and, it, and it's very, you know, and I don't care, it, and it comes back to semantics again, um, which Susan was talking about earlier. You can call them different things. I don't care what you call them. Some people call those mission statements, some people call them different things. Call them what you want, but some people are engaged more because they're more kinesthetic, they're more feeling orientated, which will be linked into the purpose. Some people, a lot of people are more visual, so they're linking to the vision side. Some people are more auditory, and this is why it's written now. <laughs> could, could you also think about the application of them as well? Because I, I often see some conflict between your vision for yourself and your organisation and what you want to achieve, and actually want to express that to your customers or your donors if you're, mm -hmm. if you're a charity. So I see that you, your vision is almost your internal, what we want to achieve, what we're going to get to, and our purpose is what we're going to say to the outside world. Yes, I know, Possibly. you can do it that way, you can do it that way. There's actually, several pages, right? There's usually, when I'm working now, it's not the same charity. It might be actually. Uh, there's usually two pages when I work with commercial organizations. One page is owned by the CEO, and that's his page, because it's typically his company, right? And on that is the spangly cars, the half in the country, the extracting half a million pound a year, all that kind of stuff, right? You do not show your employees that page, <laughs> right? <laughs> Believe me, I've seen that done once. Not a good move. Um, so you have your page, which you're bought into personally, right? Now, in challenge, I think it's probably the same page, uh, but it's what you're talking about is the internal page, right? Okay. Bang on. Now, you might have a separate page, which would be pretty similar, but for the outside world. Now, if you want to raise capital, it's up. all the elements will be there. So once you've done your first page, whether, and that's probably the first page is your internal page, because the most important statement is you and your board. Once you've kind of got that, you can tweak that page. If you want to raise capital off it, you want to go external with it, you need to tweak elements of the page. You can do marketing, yeah, anything. Yeah. yeah. Just tweak the page. Tweak the page. Yeah, yeah. okay. And just being sensible in that tweaking. Because mm. if the values is, for instance, um, we just raised a quarter million for a company in London, and one of their values, because we, we shared it with, uh, they're not really seasonal, really, they're just high end angels, but uh, one of the values was fun, right? Fantastic. So, uh, which is great, because I'm all about fun. Um, I knew the angel that was coming in to invest, and I know he wasn't much fun. Um, so I went, right, we're going to keep fun in, because it's integral and it's really, really important. So we're not going to fudge our values for anybody, because our values are there internally. We recruit on values. We also recruit externally from values. People who have had customers or stakeholders, think about the ones who, excuse my friendship, pissed you off. Mm. They typically cross the value, right? Now, if you very carefully select your customers, I was somebody asked me earlier, who, who do I, you were, we were talking earlier, you said, who do I work with? Who are my yeah. customers? And uh, is it certain industry sectors? There's only one commonality between all my customers, 
and this is why I do the page, I start with purpose. All of my clients have really strong purposes and great values, which are aligned to mine. Because if they don't, I won't work with them. Simple. A little trickier in charity, but to be frank, we've done this in Global Angels. Unless donors and sponsors are aligned to the values of Global Angels, we don't want their money. It's quite a ballsy statement, but it's true. It's actually because we're people coming into charity for the wrong reasons. That's tough when you get when you when you scrambling for cash, it's a bit of a tough call to up to make, but think about it. Okay. Right, coffees. Um, and if you if, if your purpose and your vision and your values and all are aligned properly, you can actually you should be able to align everybody right down to the volunteer base to what you're all about. This is the point of this. So absolutely. And most of your plans should have a people element to it. Mm-hmm. If people are integral to your business, which in most cases they would. It's a good one. It's a really good one. And who else? You guys, because you two are complicated too. So what can you see? Yeah, I was, I was working for the local government sector. I was to implement a paid for services strategy. Mm. So as the public sector purse contracts and there's less money to pay us for, yeah. which we do at the moment, we need to find a way to earn money from other, other sources. sources. Brilliant. Now we're going to come on to KPIs and the key performance indicators. Now this is in business. We see, I see this in a different way. A lot of businesses are over-reliant on certain sources of income. I've got one client, 80% of revenues come from one client. And he wants to exit. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Mm-hmm. Right? So the exit strategy is a bit longer because now one of our KPIs is percentage of revenue from that client and we're working it down. We're going to get it to 45% in three years so he's not reliant on that client. Right? So that's a good KPI. So percentage of revenues <coughs> on a certain thing. So when you're, you know, and I've seen this a lot more in the charity sector, percentage reliance on government funding. I was actually in a, an Academy Chief Executive group where a charity sits, actually. And their, her whole KPI, when we did the whole KPI session, was reducing the reliance on government funding over a five year period. It's not gonna happen overnight. But unless you focus on it now, I guarantee it's not gonna go away as a problem. Facing the problem. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to get down to a little bit of the now in a minute, but I just wanted to punch up the strategy a little bit. Okay. So two F words. Right. The first one is fear. Now this is an interesting one. Now this is a real life because on my quest to mountaineering, I faced fear an awful lot. On my quest on business, I faced fear an awful lot. I've been exec and non-exec on 18 different boards now, and I've faced fear an awful lot in those board situations, because originally I was quite young on the boards as well. And it's a scary place to be. Some, some of these board people are quite nasty. Um, they're quite mean. So, you know, you're going to face fear along the way. That was when I was in the Alps. Before I had to go and climb a mountain in Alaska, I found myself 200 foot up on a vertical rock face, and I have to say, it's the most scared I've ever been in my life. I was literally balancing from a finger and a toe. And I thought, we're only actually born with two fears. Do you know what they are? So the fear of loud noises. And, yes. Uh, I can't think of the one. It's no, falling. Falling. Yeah. falling. Yeah. So there's the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. In that case, I was facing the two fears I was born with. <laughs> I was going to fall and then make a very loud noise with the ground. <laughs> okay? Now, was my fear real? Yeah. yeah. Do you think it's my fear was real? Well, no. Was no. There you go. If you'd have tried to tell me that at the time, I'd tell you what I would have told you, but I'm not yeah. going to this <laughs> All right? But I had ropes. The thing is, I hadn't learned to trust the rope. Because I was literally thrown up. I had very little preparation. I was there to do a sex climbing, and this was irrelevant to what I needed to do. And the, the rock that actually my guide was a bit rubbish, to be frank. He took me up a rock face without understanding my ability. <coughs> it's a business. Sometimes you... you you're facing business problems, you're taking up a business rock face without having the ability, and you can face fear along the way. So what I'd say is learn to trust the rope a little bit first. We're talking how do you do it now? Well, you might be facing the strategic problem that you want to face in the year. Maybe a bit scary to you right now. You might even want to ignore it. Okay? Well, what we have to do is step into it slowly and start to learn to trust the rope along the way a little bit more. All right? Now the next. So. In charity, in strategy, ask yourself what you're scared of right now. And if there's anything you're scared of, I would suggest you underpin it with a strategy. Because it's probably not going to go away. Okay? 
That's the first thing. Second F word is failure. Now, this is an interesting one in the charity context because entrepreneurs and business owners take risk all the time. And guess what? You might fail. It's part of the game. In charities, you don't have that luxury so much. Or maybe you don't do it enough. Okay, so the last time I failed was there. Now, this is a mountain called Denali. It's in the depths of Alaska. And I got to there. <coughs> Took me a month. Okay. 200 meters from the top, I got shut down in the biggest storm I thought I was going to die. Okay. That was a failure. Was it? I didn't sure. summit. I didn't summit. Now, I learned a lot about myself, but this is why I used adventure as a, uh, as a metaphor, because I find it's a very good metaphor in business. Is that sometimes we're trying to we're trying to reach the summit. We've got to do this. We've got to hit a number of people. I need to I need to hit a hundred people in my community. But you only touched sixty this year, so we failed. And I just understand what failure looks like, because with fear comes a risk of failure, and we have to understand that it's okay, particularly in charity, because charities, I would humbly suggest, is part of the thing that holds charities back is the inability to take the calculated risks based off fear that there may be some more failure. Now, I'm not saying go out and bet the shop because under charity commission you're not allowed to, okay? But just understand, will it sink you? If so, don't do it. All right? But we've got to take some risks. Now, I'll give you a live example. When I was chairman of the multiple sclerosis centres in Gloucestershire, I, um, I faced a trustee board and I wanted to bring in a professional fundraiser. Now, for those who have trustee boards, you might know what I'm talking about here. Sometimes they're a little bit of a challenge, okay? They might not agree with you. And because bringing on a professional fundraiser was a risk. They'd never done it before. They were scared of the unknown. And there was a likelihood that it could fail. Because what could happen? You pay a professional fundraiser, and what could happen? They don't raise any money, yeah? That's failure. And that's all oh, now I'm not prepared to take that risk. So in this case, you know, it wasn't massive. We were looking to raise about 50 million, right, in a year. And it was gonna cost us, you'd know in six months if a professional fundraiser is gonna is gonna if they haven't lent you any money in six months, let's just face it, they're not gonna earn you any money. And the retainer was like, I think it was 150 quid a month was the retainer, and they took a percentage of whatever they earned, right? Which was again another scrap for the trustees. Oh, taking a percentage of money they earned, that, that was against the values. Well, not really. If they, earned 15, if they earned 50 grand, and you have to give them a couple of grand as a result of it, you'd have to pay them a wage to register that money for you. So, really? Well, work. Well, now, everyone's got different opinions about them, saying there's rights or wrongs. But in that case, if it wasn't for me as an entrepreneur, prepared to take a risk and prepared to fail, we would not have done that. And the only way I could get it through the board was I put my personal money on the table to guarantee it. And I said, there's six months worth, it sits there in that pot. If they don't do what they're gonna do, you keep my money. And guess what, he came in and he earned a lot of money. And now he's an integral part of the charity. So, now that's, that's a, an example of sometimes you have to buck the trends or do things in a different way. And change is something we're gonna talk about a little bit more. How do, you, how do you start to instigate that change? Well, sometimes you need to think out the stuff box a little bit, okay? Now, I also know your core. As a charity, you're going to have a core, you're going to have something that you're really, really good at. Know what that is, strategically. And some of the strategies that you have on your page that you want to execute will not be your core, and that's why you're probably ignoring them. Or you're probably scared of them. And it doesn't mean you have to do them yourself. If you know what your core is, bringing in other people to execute on those strategies. It doesn't have to be you. So, uh, we haven't got time. Uh, this is, sorry, this is for... Um, this is for the Academy Chief Executives, which is kind of a little bit longer, so we're gonna, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna do that now, because we wanna go into KPIs a little bit. But just think about the five areas of strategy you've talked about. Does it cover anything that you, is there anything you wanna add to that based off fear? Is there anything you wanna punch up based on failure? And look at where your core is and think outside of that, because on the page, you'll see there's also a who does it, and it doesn't always have to be you. All right? Now, the next piece is business, Growth indicators or KPIs, key performance indicators, uh, which is these, these, these here. Now, so you've got your strategy in the year, okay? 
these are the five big things I want to achieve in the year. Well, how are we going to measure it? Uh, in business, it's the, I like a KPI, if you're focused on something new, <coughs> measure it. So if you're focused on a new product, you know, we can, you can look at revenues and you can look at profitability and it can be trending in the right way, but it's masking an underlying problem that the, the thing you're putting all your time and energy in is not actually yielding you any money. So if there's a strategy, you should be measuring it. Measure your people. Measure your volunteer base. You know, you could have a KPI as active num number of active volunteers right now. You know the word active. Okay? And to find, to find what that means. And it might be that your current active volunteer base is 50, and you actually want it to be 30. Because there's 20 in there which are causing you a lot of pain and headache, because you don't need that anymore. So the strategy underpinning that would be rational as a volunteer base. Okay? So you can measure, measure marketing. If you're spending any money in the marketing or promotion or PR or whatever else, measure it. If there's any major spend going out, measure it. You know, that's the, thank goodness, not so many people in marketing are now talking about return on investment for marketing. Because that was fluffed over for many years. Um, and they got away with it for many years as well, which is amazing. Okay? So, but it particularly said, if you'll be putting hard earned charitable money into promotion or whatever else, then you won't. Make sure you're measuring it. Or reduce, Say again? Reduce the spend. And, or, absolutely. You could look at that spend, or, well, especially with what you do, Susan. Okay? You could look at that spend and you go, well, really, should we be spending any money on that? Ask yourself the question. If you're £50,000, but I need the extra, I might be able to get £50,000 by spending less, less on, on what I'm doing. doing. Absolutely right. And this is what numbers, as soon as you start measuring your numbers, you can do ratios of you know, revenue to overhead or expenditure and look when you see that um, if you've got a lot of employees I like the ratio of um, you can either do it per, per uh, profit per head or you can do percentage of revenue um, that is spent on PAYE <coughs> that's, a, that's an interesting indicator actually so if you've got for instance 50% because a lot of charities are people businesses most of the money goes actually in the people side so you should be measuring that and you'll find there's a sweet spot, is that if you're 40%, so 40, if you've got, there's 100 grand, 40 grand is going to the people side. You've got to find out where you are, um, where it feels comfortable, where you're kind of on the edge, you're not fat and lazy, but you're not so lean you can't execute on everything. And you, you'll find as you grow, you need to move with that. And actually, that as a, as a, as a KPI is a really important trigger to point when you recruit. Because what you find is, if you start slipping down to 30%, you're getting too lean, and you can't actually execute on the strategy you've got. If you're moving up towards 50%, you've got too fat and lazy, time to rationalise. And you'll find that there's a sweet spot. And not many people measure this, and people do the whole recruitment people thing on gut feeling, oh, I think I need somebody else in that little bit. Because it actually can be measured. So think about your business, your charity, think about how you can measure it. So in terms of like customer service, so the yeah. one of the charities that I, I'm a trustee of provides advocacy support, yeah. that's a really hard thing to put a number on. Mm -hmm. You're talking to people, did you, did you see the advice you wanted? Is your circumstance now better as a result of the advocacy we provided? So it's a, it's a kind of acceptable or not acceptable. It's a word of the number thing. It doesn't have to be, that can be a number thing. I have a lot of companies. It, I'd say probably a third of my client base measure customer service. Yes. Because you can actually put out quite, you know, you've seen, you've seen all the questionnaires that come out to you through emails, but measure our performance, blah, 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 blah. Because they put numbers on it. What do you rate it on? What fine. And I've got one client whose top KPI indicator at the moment is customer service to one client. I've got to say who it is because I can't, but it's there measuring it. And up here, actually, I think that's exactly there. Um, you've got EFQM, which is quality management scores and most of it. Corporates have got very complex, amazing measuring stuff. You don't need to get complicated, but you've got to make it irrelevant to you. Find the numbers that bring you alive. Now, the trick to this is that the kind of the hammock, <coughs> the hammock test. If you can sit, there you go. You've already got your exit there. If you're sitting there in your hammock in uh, where are you going to Canada? Oh, Jackson Hole or something. There you go. He's got it all sorted, right? If you're sitting there in your hammock, and you, you don't want to sell your businesses, you want to be able to maintain your businesses. This is your dashboard. You should be able to look at each this number and know that the business is sustainable. Now the trouble is most people are measuring past stuff. Revenue, profit, stuff that's already happened. Measure future stuff too. 
Because you could sit here going, oh, revenue's great, people ratios are fine, profit's good. What you don't realise is that there's no pipeline, there's no business coming in, and your grant funding is just dried up. So if grants are something that's important, put a future measurement in here. Next quarter, pipeline. Or next year, granting, agreed, not agreed. Measure it. Okay? Because you might have a problem coming your way. And actually, if you know the problem's coming your way, the trick with this is you see problems coming faster than you would if you weren't measuring it. And that means you can react and make a decision quicker as well. My feeling is that. Yeah, I mean, it's one of the clients I was working with uh, didn't understand the difference between where their customer was. Yeah. Uh, it was an education establishment, and they felt that because the parents chose the school, the parent was the customer. And they didn't realise that the child is the consumer. And so it was only when the school changed yeah. its complete attitude to realising the child was actually the customer. And I just wonder how many people... Uh, in the wine trade, we have a saying that you haven't sold a bottle of wine until it's been drunk. Mm. Mm. Um, you know, whether you, if you're growing it you haven't, and you've just sold it on you, until it's been drunk, you haven't actually sold it. And I wonder how many of us don't actually realise who our actual customer is compared to who some of our staff think our customer is. Absolutely. And in particular, I think businesses... Sometimes, but that's a, it's a bit more grey in business sometimes, but in charities, I think that, that could be a huge issue of who you think, because so many people, you're so busy mm -hmm. trying to please the trustees and the law and all the rest of it, you actually forget who you're trying to serve. <coughs> and in Global Angels, Molly's the opposite. She's just all about the children. Everything's about the children, whereas we've got to rein her up and go, we've got a, got a global infrastructure to fund here, you know, we calm down, we need to, we've got to make sure this is self-sustaining. So you've got to have that balance as a CEO, you've got to see all sides. And know what number's relevant to you. Your numbers are different. So, you know, who are you serving in sister, sister to sister stuff? Sisters, I guess. But, you know, but you're, you're going to have ramifications across multiple stuff. How do you measure how, many, how do you measure your impact? So, how could you? Think about that. And it could be how many people are we touching? It could be as simple as that. But if you don't know that, how do you know what impact you're making? Pick the number one strategy. Pick the number one KPI and keep an eye on it constantly. You decide what that is. It's probably the one where the fear and failure sits. It's probably the one which hurts the most, where they may need the most pain, or the one you're not doing. Okay? And strategically, it's normally finance. Okay? And that's in business. And in charity, I guess I reckon the stats would be more something to do with finance, future finance, future funding, future something. It's probably not historically, but it's going to be something in the future. Now, I'm going to give you five minutes to now bring it into action, okay? Now, through this year, I'm not doing mentors at the moment, I'm doing an Ironman, because my kids are really young and I can't be away for more than a month because uh, of my babies. So, on my list, of my bucket list of things to do is Ironman. So at the moment, Ironman, so the big vision and the big thing is Ironman, right? Now that scares me. It should scare anybody that's attempting it. And could I fail? Yes. Massively. <laughs> Fundamentally. But what I've done is, I've broken it down strategically. It was, it's been a part of a three-year plan. Three years ago I couldn't swim, I couldn't ride a bike. So I started to build it up slowly. And now I can swim-ish. It's not a bit of work to do. And the bikes, the cells get smaller, it's getting a little bit more uncomfortable but uh, it's kind of moving forward. What it goes to me, the only way I can do an Ironman is if I go training today. So if I don't train today, or tomorrow or the next day, I will not cross that finishing line. So you have great strategies, goals, Ironman, strategy on the bike, rest of it. Unless you do it, you do something now, it ain't gonna happen. So what, you, what we've got to get to now is five core actions, you are going to achieve 28th of February, so it's March. That will be March. What's the five core actions without the tactics now? But what are the five core actions you are going to execute in March? Okay? Now, in an ideal world, there'll be one action aligned to every one of the major strategies you've identified for the year. Some strategy actually might be you can't do anything towards it right now. Um, you're talking about a conversation with the CEO. It doesn't have to be rocket science here. It could be a conversation. It could be go and research this. It could be look at that, talk to somebody. But what are the five things you're going to do 
The whole point of being here today is you walk away and you do something differently. Otherwise you've wasted the morning. Now I've given you, you're getting clarity around the purpose, the big stuff. You're getting clarity around the strategy in the year. If you do not go away and do something, that all of our thinking has been wasted. So think about the five things you're going to do. And next month when you come back, you can check if they've done it or not. That's the, there's power in the meeting once a month, because you hold each other accountable, which we'll come on to in a little while, which is accountability. So just take a couple of minutes individually on that one, because it's your own individual actions. Take just two or three minutes. What are you going to do? A lot of people are migrating towards their comfort zone. Okay, just be careful on that. Now, the reason the page works is the page flows. So typically there'll be a, the reason I'm talking about the different elements, say that's finance, ops, sales, fundraising, whatever it means, it flows down to the year, it flows down to the month. You should have a balance of strategic actions or tactics going on in the month. Now, um, Wayne, I'm going to pick on you, um, yeah. sorry, but you know, what Wayne did here, which is nothing wrong with it, is he picked up his top one strategically. He was like, right, that's it, that's, that's the one I think I'm going to do. And then all of his five actions were around that one thing. Yeah. Right? That's off the page. It's tactical. It's in the planning stuff that Susan was talking about earlier. Right? There's nothing wrong. It's got to be done. But then, it get, and this is why I find a lot of people are unbalanced strategically because they get focused on the tactical bit of one bit and they're plowing down that route. The whole point with the page is it keeps you every month, you're doing four or five things balanced across, strategically across the organisation. So if you're not keeping an eye on the numbers, you haven't got a bit doing an element of operations or sales or fundraising, then you're unbalanced, you're going down potentially a slippery slope. And then when you come to review quarterly or yearly, one area is going to be this huge hole in it. Can I, I, I think one of the really important things about strategy is that you pick out the things that possibly aren't going to change very much. Correct. So that you, I think what needs to change is how you deliver that strategy, doesn't it? So mm -hmm. some of your core funding is pulled, then you need to have an approach that tells it? you how to go to somewhere else. Right? But if we get I, the idea in the head that the strategy can change all the time, then it probably isn't no, strategy, no, no, no. is it? That, that's going to stay really said, important. It's out these of other the things. five core elements here, yeah. four probably won't change at all. Yeah. Right? Because some things are fundamental. Right? And they're yeah, always they them. Got to change because somebody might have their notice. They, this this is why yes. I boil strategy down to the month because the change happens here. Yeah. Ultimately, this doesn't change at all, really. Yeah. Right? You need to you need to tap into this once a year and refresh it. Sometimes a word changes, or uh, you know, we talked about words earlier with you two about that. You know, using the word engage or empower or inspire. You know, a word can make a difference. Uh, the three to five year strategy shouldn't fundamentally change. That, that stays there. The year, it's the Pareto law, 80-20. You know, 80% of the strategy should remain solid. But if you do not allow a little bit of flex, and some of, you know, some of the companies I'm working with, there is no flex. The bigger companies, there is much, because we're pretty, the strategy is actually bang on. So you don't need to change for the sake of change, but you need to be able to adapt and respond if something out of the ordinary comes. So with, like a recession, not many people saw that one that many. Now, now with the, the final piece of this, um, oh sorry, any other, any other comments around actions? Anything else to come out for people? Do you all have them? Are you all clear on what you're doing in March? I'm just going to pick on something now. Who's looking at their shoes? Uh, what are you doing in March? Um, I'm having a, a meeting with uh, my colleague, so we head the organisation together, yeah. and then we're going to look at the finance cash flow and uh, future cash flow as well. Um, so what's coming in, what potentially can come in, etc, etc, and what risks they are. Yeah. So literally doing these together um, and setting our long term and short term goals um, together, uh, and making sure the systems are in place. And also, whilst we're doing that, we want to make sure that we're monitoring customer service. Great, so there you go, we're talking about well done Susan, bringing a customer service, now you can start to measure it, how do you measure it? So if you did those things in March, do you think you'd be a step further to where you are now? Certainly. Yeah, certainly, that's the, that's the response I want to, certainly is good. And that's it look guys, the whole thing with strategy is if you do what you say you're going to do, when you say you're going to do it, 
strategy is quite simple. All right? I'm, going, I'm trying to take the illusion of strategy. Now, this is how I measure it for my customers. You'll get this on the page when I send it to you, it's page two. Because the trick is, right? This is how I work with my clients. This is how you need to work with yourselves, or you know, you've got the group environment to do it yet. March, you sit down with your page, you do all that, this doesn't change very much at all. This is what I said I'm going to do this month, mm -hmm. right? Five core points. Make sure they're balanced, because you've got, you've got the finance there, you've got the customer service there. Just check the other elements, fundraising, whatever. Just check the best and balanced actions and how you can measure it. Mm -hmm. These are the numbers I said I'm going to do. I'm going to see two fundraisers this month. I'm going to do, you can, you can break it down to whatever granularity you want. But you put it in and said, this is what I'm going to do. This is what we actually did. So, copy, paste. All right? I like to keep things simple. So copy and paste. That's what you said you're going to do. Actuals. Actuals in numbers. These are the numbers I said I was going to do. Here's the numbers I actually did. And, and the strategic actions, that's a lot easier, right? Because that is, I said I was going to do this. Did you do it? Green is, I did it. Red is, I didn't. Amber is, I nearly did, but I need one more answer. It was very, very close. And don't try to bullshit yourselves, okay? Now, the power of this is accountability. This is the power of the Academy Chief Executives, is accountability. Month in, month out, who are you leaders accountable to? Who was acting for them? Okay, so you're accountable to the Board of Directors. As a, you know, if you're on the board of directors, remember most of the time, most of the strategy starts from the top. Who does the board of directors want, you know, responsible to? Themselves. Um, CEOs are typically responsible to no one. Okay, if you're running your own business, you'd be responsible to no one but yourself. And that's where you can easily not do the things you say you're going to do because you get busy doing other stuff. This keeps you on track. And what this does for me, it's brilliant for me because my clients just come and go, this is what we said we were going to do. And guess what? Guess who they've got to face the next month? <laughs> me. All right? And I don't hold any punches, trust me. And that's what you can do within this group. Within this group, you hold each other accountable. And this, I traffic light everything. Because what this spots is, it spots strategic emergencies a mile off. Because as something starts trending amber, you get on it and you get it done quickly. If start, something starts trending red, it's amazing in the actions. This is where you get real. This is where you actually realise if you're overcooking what you think you can do in a month. Because mm. you'll find things just stay there. And you realise that the month is very tactical and it needs to be stuff you can do. And stuff, stuff people, what you do is you start to say, um, I want to change the whole board structure, do this, and, and, and get to full accountability and buy in through the whole organisation in March. And it's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> All right? So you learn to get really realistic in the month of what you can achieve. And sometimes, you know, the first three months are really clunky because it's like people are overachieving or underachieving and reds are flagging or whatever. What I find is that after then, after about three to six months, you've got trend. You've got a visual trend. And if something's trending red down here, something will be trending red up here shortly after if you're measuring strategy. So it's giving you an indicator early. The whole point of being an indicator is it's giving you an indication earlier than you normally would do. Okay, so that's on the page for you. It's your choice who you want to hold yourself accountable to. Um, now the next thing, well five minutes before we're going to wrap this all up, is bringing it alive. So you start to see that the power of the page is, um, let me go back a minute. The power of the page, now, once you've got everything on the page, you can see you've already kind of got elements around this and this and this and this. You've still got work to do to get yourself on the page, but it does not take <coughs> Long period of time. It takes me three sessions with clients to get them on the page fully, two hours each. Um, I won't do it in a half a day because it's too much. It needs to be done over time. All right? It does not take long to get people on the page. Just about asking the right questions. The um, imagine you're on the page. You're really clear on all the different elements of your purpose, and you've got total clarity on your vision and your values as a company. Okay? You know what makes yourself different where you operate and what market space you operate in and what's your promise to your customers when you're really clear on who your customers are. You know based off that what your core long-term strategy is and the different elements of it and the breakdown of that in the year of here are the major things I need to achieve this year in my company and how you can measure that in KPI terms. 
and you've got it down to the, this is what we're going to do this month as a company, and this is how we're going to measure it. That's powerful. That's powerful on many fronts. One, it gives you, to, as leaders, total clarity of what you're doing. You get that, you get everybody in your company aligned to that. You are bucking the trend of 85% of individuals out there have no idea what their company's about. 90% of employees say they have, not, they have no goals in their company and they're not aligned to anything. You're bucking the trend of being totally aligned. The trick with that then is, is bringing it alive. Because the first thing is getting it on the page. But then you can, because if you're not pumped by that, I would suggest you go and do something else that you are pumped by. Because if you're not, and this is a real great one on an interview stage, is once you're clear that you want someone to work for you, you share the page with them. And if they're not really excited, I would not employ them. Because if they are not like, oh wow, I'm totally behind the purpose of this company, and I, those are, the values are like my values. So they're going, yeah, whatever, what's the salary? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? So just, this page is used as a recruitment tool, particularly in your industry, because if you do not have people behind you 100%, now, volunteers, that's where they're going to get interesting with this. So the first thing then to bring it alive is rhythm. Everyone should have a rhythm and a pulse from the very top of the company. Okay? Now, you've already started to talk about this. Talk as, as a board or the top of the company, you need to put yourself in a strategic rhythm. Monthly is a minimum. Initially, probably needs to be every week or two weeks. And that rhythm is meeting rhythm. And each meeting rhythm needs to... Now, don't, do not do meetings for the sake of meetings. That's pointless. You should have a strategic meeting at least once a month. Cover them off the page. That's why the page is down to monthly. Okay? So set your rhythms with people. And rhythm flows through the company. There should be a financial rhythm to the new company. Only certain people need to be involved in that. This is this whole illusion of everybody just needs to be in on every meeting. That's just futile. You just waste so much time. But there's a sales rhythm. There's a marketing rhythm. There's a finance rhythm. There's an overall strategic rhythm. Just find out what your rhythms are and get those rhythms in place. So will you with your, your partner, minimum, uh, pretty tame in every fortnight to start off with whilst you just get on top of everything, and then monthly rhythms as a minimum. And this four months is a rhythm. It's your monthly strategic check-in, basically. Um, so rhythm goes through the whole company. It starts at the top, works its way down. The, the next thing then to bring it alive is theme. This is where you can get fun. This is about bringing fun. You talked about fun. We talked about fun when we first met, right? You should be pumped by this page. This should be something that really excites you. And as a result, how do you engage everybody else in the company? Now, not everybody's going to be pumped by the, the three-year vision or whatever else, but they need to be engaged fully. And it's about making it exciting. Now, the best example I've heard of this is a company in America, the whole thing was massive growth. And it was about stepping up and being one of the big boys because they've been small for a long time. <coughs> And they kind of still thought themselves small. They weren't anymore, they were big. And the CEO rode into the annual meeting on an elephant. Mm -hmm. right? And the theme for the year was elephants. <laughs> and growth, and size. And actually a bigger boy now. Now, do you think anyone forgot that? No. I forgot it, I only heard the story once. I wasn't even there. Now, don't encourage you going down to Dudley Zoo and getting an elephant out of it, right? Well, that might work, I don't know what. I don't know what the laws are around that. But think about what theme used to you. Now, I've got companies that work in more um, competitive environments. They've used the Tower of London. All the CEOs boards are dressed up as knights. And then they're going to battle. And they've got shields around the office. And they have a lot of fun with it. They've got a blast. Uh, I've got fashion companies I work with. That for them, it's all, about, <laughs> it's all about fashion and dresses and everything else. And they reward themselves accordingly. Yeah, so you can bring in the theme. The theme's got to be relevant to everybody. You know, if in Global Angels, it's an angel theme because it's all about Global Angels. That's what we're all about. Everything's got a theme to it. It's all got angel themes to this. Um, not angels and halos, angels and everything else, but it's just, it's just got that angel theme to everything we do. So it's angel parties and angels and angel concerts. There's wings are everywhere, and there's a step up board, and you've got massive wings behind you, so everyone gets their photo stepping up, because they're stepping up. Um, with your hands up, massive angel wings behind you to say, I am an angel, and I'm stepping forward and helping the strategy cha charity. Amazing thing. Everyone's buying. You check, if you check out the website, you'll see all the different stars and celebrities who all want to be part of the angel thing. They want to be angels. And we've got corporate angels, 
We've got individual angels. Brilliant theme. But it's got to be really meaningful. Okay? So think about what your theme is um, and how you can bring it alive. And the final piece, which is around values, which we haven't had a chance to touch on today, because that's a whole issue and topic in its own right. Actually. I'm sure that you'll get a speaker on that at some point, because that's a whole different thing. But uh, it's about creating legends. And this is about, if your set of values are established, and it's about going the extra mile. So if one of your values is you go the extra mile, then if somebody in your company, a volunteer, goes the extra mile, you reward them, you emphasize that, you create a legend out of it, and you make that story go round. Equally, if someone does something bad, that's difficult because you can't sack volunteers. I think you can, but that's a whole different issue I'm not going to go into. But you can, if someone gets fired or someone leaves the company, you've got to set the establish that the legend around that yourself quickly. Because the rumour mill will do it for you. And it's a question of whether or not you control that. Because if a volunteer leaves and leaves under a bit of a cloud of you know, greyness, they will make sure everyone knows what their story is and it might be the wrong one. And you've got to say, and you've got to cut that quickly. You've got to say, Joe left because he's no longer aligned with the values of this company, he's not aligned to the values, and we cannot have people who are not totally aligned to what we're doing around here. Set the legend yourself, otherwise it will be set for you. Okay? And this is a whole topic, so bringing it alive is what my whole keynote's around, I love this bit. You've got to get on the page before you can bring it alive. So I hope that helps, it should be clear, that's me done. So hopefully, you know, a little bit of thought around the purpose piece, how the strategy lines up in the year, and also, more important, what you're going to do and how you're going to step into it in the month. So thank you very much, and I will see you at lunch.